You may be seated. Our sermon title this morning is Fight the Good Fight of Faith. Fight the Good Fight of Faith. And our text is 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we're going to be looking at this paragraph that runs from verse 11 through verse 16. Fight the Good Fight of Faith. In a complicated drama lasting more than 15 years, William, Duke of Normandy, was now on the precipice of war with England. The English throne, recently vacated by the death of Edward the Confessor in January of 1066 AD, was now in the hands of a rival. William believed that the throne of England was his by right, and it became clear that he would have to take it by force. The military campaign, later named the Norman Conquest, had as its strategic goal the overthrow of Harold II, the very powerful English Earl of Wessex, and the subjection of the English Isles to Norman control. William, later to be named William the Conqueror, was positioning himself to rule an empire. Now, having gained support from the papacy and from the Norman aristocracy, William assembled a force of troops and ships and made preparations for his invasion. While Harold was occupied defending England against the Viking invasion from the north, William crossed the channel, making landfall in the south near Pevensey on September 28, 1066. Upon news of the assault, Harold rushed south to face William at Hastings, arriving at dawn on October 14th. Now, William was known for his courage and known for his superior combat strategy. With respect to his courage, William positioned himself in the battle at the front of the fight in full armor urging on his troops. At one point, a cry arose in the ranks that William had died in battle and that the army began to lose heart. And so William, at the front lines, removed his helmet, rode up and down on the very front of the battle lines, yelling, I live, I live, fight on, and we shall conquer yet. It was William during the battle at Hastings who utilized this strategy called a tactical retreat. Retreating from your enemy stringing them out and fighting them as you go in order to gain more favorable ground against them. It was William on this invasion who instituted castle building as a strategy for medieval warfare, most famous of his Mott and Bailey castles being the Tower of London. And due to the courage of the Norman invader and superior military tactics, Harold, with nearly half of his force, was killed in battle. The remaining English troops were scattered by nightfall. William the Conqueror was crowned King of England in Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day in 1066. Now, it's apparent from history that William was also a wicked man and had done many wicked things. And just like all men, both small and great, he will one day stand before God in judgment at the great white throne to give an account for his life. But in an argument here, from the lesser to the greater, If a conquering king embattled in a sinful campaign would employ great courage and well-devised strategy in the agonizing pursuit of a perishable crown, and how much more those fighting the good fight of faith embattled in a glorious campaign armed with weapons mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds should employ great courage courage and well-devised strategy in the pursuit of an imperishable crown. Paul personally charges Timothy now in verses 6 through 11 to fight the good fight of faith. Then praise God, we are not left without a glorious reasons for great courage. We're not left without glorious reasons for great perseverance, without glorious reasons for a great striving and a great fight and powerful strategies for claiming a great victory that has already been won on our behalf in Christ. Blessed is the man who endures, for he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now in our passage today, we're going to examine this good fight of faith, good fight of faith from four different aspects of the battle. One aspect, we'll look at a tactical retreat in verse 11. Fighting the good fight of faith requires the use of a tactical retreat, fleeing the enemy while fighting to gain advantage. Point two, we're going to look at a strategic offensive from verse 11, a strategic offensive. 
This strategic offensive is defined as an aggressive projection of force in order to gain an objective, in order to achieve a tactical goal or to shift the balance of power, a strategic offensive. Then point three, we're going to look at the Christian campaign in verse 12. Campaign refers to a large-scale, long-duration strategy toward a strategic goal. And lastly, in point four, we're going to see the Christian's strategic goal. This is the desired end of ongoing combat operations. Now, you'll need all four of these perspectives in fighting the good fight of faith. Let's take one, a tactical retreat in verse 11. Paul begins to Timothy, but you, O man of God, flee these things. Now, the use of a tactical retreat in battle is ultimately a strategy to defeat your enemy. It may appear as though to be a retreat, but its whole purpose is to string your enemy out, to chop them down, to divide and conquer. As you retreat, your enemy breaks line and pursues. As the enemy pursues, he is strung out into smaller and smaller offensive units in which you are more able to fight as you pull back into a stronger position against them. A good military strategy, strategist must know when to pull back. He's got to know when he needs to uh, retreat and what dangers he must avoid. And a tactical retreat is often needed in fighting the good fight of faith. Sometimes you need to flee. And here in verse 11, you, O man of God, flee these things. Now, Paul begins in verse 11, and each section, each section of this small clause is significant. Is significant. He begins in verse 11, but you. Martin Lloyd Jones once said he was thankful for the buts in the Bible. There are many buts in the Bible, and he was thankful for them. Here, this but, beginning in verse 11, alerts Timothy and alerts us to a, a glaring, obvious contrast. There's a great contrast here. Each time Timothy gets a but you, it's followed by a description of the enemy and that kind of ministry, that kind of ministerial work that Timothy is to avoid, and he's to avoid it like the plague. He's showing here a contrast now between true and false, showing a contrast to Timothy between godly ministry that Timothy is to have and the ungodly false teachers and the ungodly effect of their teaching. 2 Timothy 3, for example, Paul says, evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you, Timothy, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, the time will come when they'll not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they're going to heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, you be watchful in all things, Timothy. Endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. That but you is for me and you, too. <laughs> Poet. <laughs> That but you is for me and you too. Uh, we're to look at the scripture and see the but you in our face, compelling us to fight the good fight of faith in the face of opposition, in the face of that wicked false teaching, in the face of all that error. The Lord says, but you, if you're claiming the name of Christ, you claim today to be a Christian, you are on the battlefield. You are in the fight. And if you're not fighting, you're sitting in there in the trench without a weapon in your hand, and you're getting run over. You've got to get in the fight here, fighting the good fight of faith. You need to be in the war. When others follow the wisdom of this world, you pursue the wisdom of God. When others depart, having loved this present world, you pursue righteousness. When they follow men, you pursue Christ. When they ignore his word, you cling to his word, obey his word, cherish his word, love his word, depend on his word. When their love has grown cold, you stir yours up to a holy fire for Christ. When others perish, preach their own minds, you preach Christ and him crucified. When others retreat in cowardice, you, O oh man of God, you, O oh woman of God, you take a stand for Christ. You take a stand for righteousness. And this is what Paul is charging Timothy with. In the face of great opposition, in the face of error, in the face of opposition that may cause a mere mortal man to retreat in retreat in, in defeat, 
Paul says to Timothy, but you, O man of God, and he charges him to tactically fight the good fight. What makes Timothy a contrast here with these false teachers is that he is a man of God. Timothy is a man of God. Paul calls Timothy a man of God. Now, these are great and emboldening and strengthening and empowering words to Timothy. Oh, man of God. Would that not be strengthening and empowering and emboldening to you as well? To have Paul, the apostle, call you a man of God, a woman of God. And if Paul walked up to me and addressed me like that, I'd be like, where is my sword? <laughs> right now, let's go out and fight the fight. Now, you could be 130 pounds, soaking wet, and you, when your trainer comes up to you and says something like that, you will feel like a sumo wrestler. <laughs> Like Martin Luther, right? Martin Luther. Though devils all the world should fill, all eager to devour us, we tremble not. We fear no ill, they shall not overpower us. This world's prince may still scowl fierce as he will. He can harm us none. He's judged. The deed is done. One little word can fell him. And that is a mighty fortress of our God. And we could crank that up and listen to that as <laughs> soldiers fighting the good fight of faith all day. Uh, by referring to Timothy that way, he's throwing him in, you understand, with all the great heroes of the faith. That word, man of God, used of heroes in the faith in the Old Testament, those words, man of God, used only here in the New Testament of Timothy. He's throwing him in with the great heroes of the faith, used of Moses, the man of God in Deuteronomy 33, used of Samuel, the man of God in 1 Samuel chapter 9, used of David, the man of God in Nehemiah chapter 12, used of Elijah, the man of God in 1 Kings 17, used of Elisha, the man of God in 2 Kings chapter 4. So Timothy is in some good company here, isn't he? Man of God. Don't you want those words to be said of you? Man of God, woman of God. The Hebrews 12 says this, therefore, we also... In chapter 11 is a great heroes of the faith chapter in the Bible. And all those heroes of the faith listed out in a great company, in a great list, in a great hall of heroes in Hebrews chapter 11. And then Hebrews chapter 12 begins, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We allow a testimony like this, allow a testimony like this to get you fired up to fight the good fight of faith. Amen. Oh, man of God. Hebrews chapter 11. Men of God through faith subdued kingdoms. Men of God through faith worked righteousness. Men of God through faith stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the violence of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness, they were made strong. They became valiant in battle. And they turned to flight armies. Oh, man of God. Cry out like Elisha. Lord, give me a double portion, right? I'm going to fight this good fight of faith. Now, these words, oh, man of God, were to have that same effect here on Timothy. That was the effect that these words would have had. This is the effect that Paul intended in calling Timothy, oh, man of God. They were to give him courage, courage in the face of difficulty, strength in the face of great opposition in Ephesus. Like Moses to Joshua in chapter 1, Moses said, Be strong, Joshua, and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. We see that promise fulfilled on the pages of Scripture time and time and time again. That if you will endure, that if you will take a step into that good warfare and embattle yourself in the good fight of faith, that the Lord will be with you. The Lord will go before you. Lord will, his presence with you will fight for you, will stand with you, will empower you, enable you, undergird you as you fight the good fight of faith. The Lord promises to put himself there in the fray right there with you. 
He is to fight. And Timothy, looking through the pages of Scripture, through the, the pages of his own history, the history of the Israelites, all through the pages of Scripture, sees that time and time and time again. And do you not think that emboldens him for what he's facing in Ephesus? Listen, it will embolden you, prepare you for what you face in your own Christian life today. And we don't face the same obstacles that they face. Praise the Lord. There may come a day when that is necessary. But you face great obstacles in your own Christian life, don't you? That's sin, which so easily ensnares us. The flesh. Listen, these are, this is a spiritual warfare. You're fighting a spiritual fight. And if you think of it simply as a physical fight, you're going to miss out. You're going to not understand here your enemy, and you're going to be beaten. You must understand this is a spiritual fight, and you need spiritual weapons. And the Lord here is giving one to Timothy, this encouragement, this emboldenment. Make Timothy want to charge hell with a squirt gun, just those words. In your Christian life, you are to fight. You are to battle. Uh, you're to battle against sin. You're to battle against persecution. You're to battle against false doctrine. You're to battle for the truth of God as a component of the pillar and truth of God, to display the truth of God, to display Christ and Him crucified. You've got to battle the weakness of your own flesh. You've got to battle the, the opposition of this wicked world. You have to be in the fight, fighting the good fight of faith. And then he says to this man of God, and it seems at the moment when he says it, that it's contradictory to what he just said. It just seems in opposition to encouraging Timothy in the fight. He says, flee these things, flee these things. What are the these things, in verse 11, that Timmy is, Timothy is to flee? He is to flee everything described in verses 3 through 10 that the false teachers were doing. Flee, Timothy, flee sin. Flee error. Flee this wicked false doctrine. He says, flee conceit. Flee controversy. Flee quarrels about words. Flee envy. Flee dissension. Flee slander. Flee evil suspicions. Flee contention. Flee strife. People who are depraved in mind. Listen, flee people who are depraved in their mind. You know a few of those? Flee those people. Don't put yourself under the influence of people of depraved minds. They are deprived of the truth. Flee them. Flee those desiring to get rich by fleecing the flock of God. This is, in verse 11 here, a tactical retreat. Timothy is to avoid, at all cost, doing what they do. Listen, in the battle, you cannot underestimate the power of the enemy. You can't underestimate the influence of one false teacher. You can't underestimate the influence of one false doctrine. You can't subject yourself to that wickedness. You must flee. How many, thinking themselves to be strong, go into the fray in ignorance and in false presumptuous boldness and find themselves shipwrecked on the rocks just days later? How many? How many have we seen fall? You don't stand there and presuppose that you can stand and fight. You flee that sin. You flee that influence. And this is a tactical retreat, a tactical retreat. We're to be bold, but we're not to be stupid. <laughs> we're to be as bold as lions, but we're not to stand and fight in the face of great temptation. We're to flee that, that temptation. Uh, this fleeing here is a continuous fleeing. It's a present tense word. It's an ongoing fleeing. It's a constant fleeing. It's a lifelong way of life fleeing. Don't ever put yourself under the influence of false teaching or sin. Get out of Dodge. Uh, you can fight on your way out the door, <laughs> but be on your way out the door. There are many times where even the strongest of us must flee. Now think about this for a moment. There are times when even the strongest among us must flee. Remember David. God said of David that he was a godly man, innocent in all matters, except for that incident with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. A godly man, and David fell when he should have fleed. Remember David. Joseph fled, didn't he? And in Joseph's fleeing, that saved him from Potiphar's wife in Genesis 39. In 2 Timothy 2, Paul charges Timothy to flee youthful lusts. 
We're told to flee sexual immorality in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. Listen, don't have anything to do with it. Every instance, every notion, every hint of sexual immorality, you take off running from that sin. There's other battles to fight. Don't stand and, and fight that one at that point. You just get out of there. Flee sexual immorality. We're to flee from idolatry in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 14. There will be other times. Other times when you're forced to stand and fight against temptation. You find yourself in a circumstance where all of a sudden, uh, without your prior knowledge, it's there in your face. It's there. The hook, the, the snare is laid out before you. The temptation is set before you. And that's when you have to fight. You're forced to fight. And you need to be prepared with the weapons that you have from the Word of God and the Spirit of God to fight. But every other time, you, O oh man of God, O oh woman of God, flee temptation. It is the fleeing of temptation that strengthens you for battle when you need to turn and fight. It's the fleeing of temptation that secures you against that sin, that teaches you how to flee the temptation that that presents, strengthens you for the battle when you have to fight. Listen, don't trivialize or marginalize the destructive influence of just one temptation, just one sin. Flee that sin, just flee. In order to flee, you've got to go all the way back upstream against that sin, whatever it is. Find out its source. Know how to possess your own vessel. You go back upstream against that sin. You find out where that sin first begins, and that's when you start fleeing. Every instance, every hint, every beginning, you learn to flee at that point. Know yourself. You've got to know yourself. And this is a tactical retreat. This tactical retreat is to help you, as Romans 8 says, to put to death by the Spirit the deeds of the flesh, the deeds of the body. And this tactical retreat is, in the great wisdom of God, a strategy to help you win in the battle against sin. It is a strategy. Know when you must flee. And many Christians thinking that they're somehow going to strengthen themselves against the fight against sexual immorality, for example, don't do anything about their environment. Don't do anything about the influences that are around them. Don't do anything about the influences that would seek to devour them in that sin. They stand in the midst of that temptation, in the midst of that bait-rich environment, thinking they will stand against it or thinking that they will learn how to stand against it. And what they'll do is they'll learn how to fail. And they'll fail and they'll fail, and they'll fail, and pretty soon you come to be enslaved by that sin. The Bible doesn't tell you to stand in the midst of that temptation and to fight. The Bible tells you to flee, flee, flee. If you're enslaved by sexual immorality, if you are enslaved by anger, if you are enslaved by bitterness, if you are enslaved by the schemes of the wicked one, the way to fight that is at every appearance without compromise, man of God, woman of God, you flee. You've got to fight. Here's some of those uh, today. Uh, there's some of those uh, you here today who, who can't flee. As a result of failing to flee, as a result of standing in there, when the Bible says flee, and you in not taking seriously the charge to flee, you've tried time and time and time again to no avail. You need to flee the wrath to come. If you are succumbing to that temptation, succumbing to that sin time and time and time and time again, you must flee the wrath to come. Sin has you on a choke chain, and the Lord is saying, flee. You are a lackey to that sin, and the Lord says to flee. Sin calls you, and you jump. The Lord says to flee. You need to cry out to God for mercy. Cry out to God for strength. Cry out to God for strategy. Cry out to God for weapons that are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. You need to cry out to God to be born again. Cry out to God for mercy for genuine repentance that produces salvation. 
Turn from your sin. Despise it. Don't you despise it. The Lord says to flee. And you don't. And you compromise and you compromise and you compromise. And you come under the influence of that sin again. When if you're a Christian, the desire of your heart is righteousness. You hunger and thirst for it. And time again, time and time again, you back under the influence of your warring members in your flesh. Don't you despise it. Don't you hate it. And use godly wisdom. Use godly strategy. Know how to possess your own vessel and flee. These are not worldly weapons that you just devise on your own. This is not gritting it out in your own power. This is a spiritual warfare. You are to avail yourself of spiritual weapons. It is the only way that you'll be victorious. And the reason that it's the only way you'll be victorious is because God in the fight will have the victory. It's victorious by his spirit. If you put to death the deeds of the body by your effort, no. If you put to death the deeds of the body by his spirit, you will live. Learn to despise it. Turn to Christ and trust Christ alone. Look to Christ by faith and he will give you the strength to flee. Some of you are making provision. Even now in your minds, in your minds now, you're making provision today to go back to your sin. Just have not separated yourself from it. You have not fled from it time and time and time again. And now, even now, you are enslaved to the point that when you leave this place making provision for your sin, you will go right back to it. And if you are using the weapons of this world, the weapons of your own flesh, you will. But listen, listen, you don't have to. In God, there are weapons that are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Do you believe it? There are many today that simply do not believe that those who practice unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so they just, as a lackey, as a lapdog, just return to their sin time and time and time again. Are you apathetic toward God? That is a wicked sin. Repent today and flee that sin. Are you indifferent toward the things of God? That is a wicked sin. Repent of that sin and turn to Christ today. Stir yourself up to holy warfare using the weapons mighty in God to pull down that stronghold in your life. You keep going back to the sin and back to the sin and back to the sin. You need to despise it and turn to Christ. Hate the sin and flee. James says flee. He says resist the devil and the devil will flee from you. Praise God. You must stand in Christ and resist the devil. Why will you not fight? In many cases, it's just simply unbelief. Somehow you don't believe. You don't believe that God's weapons are mighty. Maybe you don't believe that you have access to them. Listen, that is a lack of faith. Look to Christ. Look to the cross and claim your weapon. Take up the sword and fight like Mr. Greatheart. You fight with the sword of the Spirit until it cleaves to your arm and becomes a part of you. You're to fight the good fight of faith. When you find yourself tempted, take up the sword of the Spirit. Put on the full armor of God and flee that sin and pursue righteousness, fighting all the way as you go. You can. In Christ, it'll be Christ that has the victory. So many don't understand the mighty weapons that they have. Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. Don't make provision for your sin. Flee. Even today, now, right now, repent. Resolve in your heart to turn from your sin. Repent and put your faith and trust in Christ to help you wage, help you fight the good fight of faith and press on for him. Endure to the end and be saved. The Lord will give you strength. His Spirit will give you power. When you flee, 
When you, in this strategic, this tactical retreat, you're turning from that sin, you're fleeing that great temptation, and in turning and fleeing that great temptation, you are turning to pursue righteousness. You're not turning to pursue other sin, you're turning to pursue fruits of the faith, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. And in this, point two on your notes, there is here a strategic offensive a strategic offensive with putting off that old man, fleeing that old man, fleeing that sin, uh, you are putting on the new man. You are putting on righteousness. Don't allow one sin to take the place of another. When you flee one sin and leave a vacuum there behind, that room nicely cleaned out, don't let another sin come in and take its place. Put in its place righteousness. Pursue genuine fruits of faith. Fighting the good fight of faith doesn't only consist in fleeing sin. It involves a strategic offensive to pursue fruits of faith. Now, strategic offensive is defined as an aggressive projection of force to gain an objective, to achieve a tactical goal, or to shift the balance of power. And here we are shifting the balance of power from sin and temptation Shifting the balance of power to righteousness, to Christ, to those weapons, to our armor. You're going to have to work for it. It is an aggressive projection of force. There are many who call themselves Christians that fight like a, a figure skater, <laughs> fight like a ballerina. Listen, you've got to wage mighty warfare and fight like a sumo wrestler. Fight like a ninja warrior. You've got to fight. That fighting now is to gain an objective. The objective is these fruits of consistency, these fruits of righteousness, fruits of holiness of life. That's your tactical goal here. You need to shift the balance of power. Shift the balance of power from wickedness to righteousness. Shift the balance of power from being enslaved to your sin to being slaves of Christ got to shift the balance of power. Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 22 says, put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt. Do you understand? Your old man grows corrupt. You're to put off that old man, that old wicked, those old wicked principles in your members according to deceitful lusts and you are to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man, Paul says to the church at Ephesus, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Colossians 3, the the same principle, putting off and putting on. And this must be an ongoing contrast in your life between fleeing the tactical retreat from sin and pursuing the strategic offensive for righteousness. And both of these are imperative commands. Paul here is commanding us to this fight. Both of these are present tense, which means this is ongoing. It is consistent, continuous. It's a way of life for the Christian. If you do one without the other, think about it now. If you do one without the other, there's a vacuum that's left in its place, and vacuums are quickly filled. In other words, if you employ tactics to flee from sin without pursuing aggressively without aggressively pursuing righteousness, then the, sp- the space left where that sin used to be will only be filled by another sin. It's like the man who's learned in his own flesh to deny himself alcohol, but now he's an angry, min- mean-spirited jerk, right? It's the woman who has fled being rebellious with her husband, but now she is bitter and resentful. It's that out of the frying pan and into the fire it's like an amusement park ride. One gets off and another one just gets on and the thing just keeps going round and round. When you flee sin, you must replace that sin with the fruits of genuine saving faith. You must replace that sin with fruits of genuine saving faith. And that begins with righteousness. Here in verse 12, it begins with righteousness. Now the Christian has already been justified already been declared righteous before God. Romans 3.21 says that we've been justified freely by His grace. So the Christian 
also stands in righteousness, as a, in Christ, the righteousness of Christ, as a free gift. When God looks at us, he doesn't see our unrighteousness, our filthy rags. He sees the righteousness of his son. We are justified. We stand in righteousness, in the imputed righteousness of Christ, and we are seen as righteous by God. So does the Christian then need to pursue righteousness? Why would it say here to pursue righteousness? Yes, the Christian needs to pursue righteousness. This is practical righteousness. There is a positional righteousness. We are made righteous, declared righteous, imputed with righteousness at salvation, and yet we must pursue practical righteousness. Conformity to Christ. 1 John chapter 2, verse 29 says that we are to practice righteousness if we are born of God. Luke chapter 1, verse 75 says that we are to live in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. Titus chapter 2, verse 12 says that we are to live righteously. Romans chapter 6 says that our members are to be instruments of righteousness. And 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 explains that Scripture is good for instruction in righteousness. Galatians chapter 5, practical righteousness is the fruit of having the Holy Spirit in you. If you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you. If you see no fruits of the Spirit, if you have not the Spirit, Paul says, you are none of His. As some of you may be deceived. You look at your own life and you think that you're doing good. The Bible says that you are not righteous. The Bible says that even your good works that you think are good, they are as filthy rags to God. You must turn from sin. You must turn from self-righteousness and obtain the righteousness that is from Christ through faith. You must put your faith in Christ. Others of you are trusting in your righteous works that you're saved. You look at your performance. You look at what you're doing. You look at how you are living the so-called Christian life and you are trusting in what you're doing as assurance, as grounds of your salvation. If you are putting your faith in how you're living your life, that is the definition of self-righteousness. You pursue righteousness through faith in Christ. Christ, it is no longer I who live, but you who live in me. I live this life by faith. Righteousness and godliness together are evidence of genuine saving faith. You're to cry out for righteousness that only comes from God through faith in Christ. It is a damning, damning, damning self-righteousness that will send you to hell. Next, he then says to pursue Pursue meaning to hasten after, to run after, to press on for godliness. Godliness. You're not to pursue these things in weakness. You're to pursue these in power. You're not to pursue these with a a satisfied, mushy, limp-wristed, weak manner. You're to pursue these in power. You're to pursue these militaristically. You're to pursue these in force. You're to press on for them. You are to, as if, take them by force. Take them in violence. You're to pursue, hasten after, press on for godliness. Again, godliness here is the conduct, the outward evidence that a genuine transformational work has taken place in your heart. It is evidence of genuine saving faith. Do you see an evidence of God's work in your heart? Do you see godliness right now with all that you know of Scripture, with all that we're saying? Do you have a picture in your mind of what genuine godliness looks like? Do you have that image, that picture? What does a a godly man look like? When Paul says to Timothy, oh man of God, what does Timothy look like? What is that picture of godliness? And how do you match up? Put yourself now on the other side. Compare and contrast. We need to pursue that understanding from God's word of righteousness. 
We need to pursue that understanding from God's word of godliness, that evidence of the transformational work of the Spirit in our heart. We're to pursue godliness. Righteousness and godliness together, that pair, are a picture of the outward conduct that is consistently a picture of what it is to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. Next, you're to pursue faith and love. The ultimate book and Christian virtues, faith and love. This is faithfulness in your Christian life and it's love for your neighbor. Faith and love. And finally, you're to pursue, you're to press on for patience and gentleness. And we see the word patience in Scripture. This word patience here is a compound word made up of under and remain. Here, patience, remaining under. Remaining under what? Remaining under Christ by faith. Remaining in faith. Remaining, fighting the good fight of faith. Persevering. Being preserved and persevering, enduring to the end. This points to a resolved, determined endurance in the fight. Listen, this life is such a short life. It is here one day, gone the next. You don't have the luxury of taking a respite from battle. You just don't have it. You cannot check out. At the moment that you begin to check out, you place yourself on a downgrade. You place yourself on a slippery slope, and one day you will seem to wake from your lethargy and you'll look at the the scope of your fall, at the distance of your fall, and you'll be ashamed. You'll be hopeless. You'll be in despair over how far you have retreated. You cannot slip from the fight. You cannot indulge yourself with a, a relaxed moment and allow yourself to be swept in the current of this world down the river in your sin. You've got to press on in the battle. How many, how many times have you, I have, when you've come across a, a difficult circumstance, something that's just hard, and at the end of that circumstance, it's as if you just, you put your shield down, and you just for a moment, as if taking a deep breath, you check out of the fight. You don't press on in fervency obeying the Lord. You don't press on in service. You don't press on in the Great Commission, fighting the good fight of faith. You don't press on in loving the brothers. You don't press on in assembling yourselves together under the preaching of God's Word, and you are swept away by the the current of this world. Having loved this present rest, Demas has forsaken me, in love with this present world, you may forsake Christ. Don't presume that you're not one of those three soils in Matthew chapter 13. For the love of this world, for the love of money, for the love of wealth, for the love of riches, for the love of leisure, for the love of pleasure, reject Christ. And it may be after one, after two, after ten years that you fully and finally reveal yourself as a hardened soil. You need to pursue perseverance. You need to pursue endurance. Hang in there in the fight. If you have retreated ground, if you've lost ground to the enemy, scratch and claw your way back in the power of the Spirit through faith in Christ and regain that territory. Don't allow yourself to be swept back. You must fight the good fight of faith. This resolved endurance, this resolved determination holds out long under difficulty. And listen, it is a learned battle skill. When you endured, you produce endurance. When you persevere, you produce in you the character of persevering in fight. When you've stayed in there, when you've hung in there, when you've pressed forward, when you've been tested by that difficulty and you come out on the other side of that battle, having persevered through the battle, it teaches you perseverance. It teaches you endurance. By the power of the Spirit, you learn to just be consistent. How many of you have felt as though just don't have the the self-control, just don't have the discipline Listen, you have to wage war, holy warfare, to put consistency, self-control, discipline into your daily Christian warfare. And trust me, Christian, from the Word of God, you do that, and you will learn to persevere. 
When that trial comes along, that difficulty, that battle, you won't be found retreating from the Lord. You'll be found standing strong in the Spirit, fighting just like you always have. It's amazing to me when we fight, fight difficulties. When something happens, when we're in the middle of a battle, and you look around, you look to the right, you look to the left, and you see those once embattled brothers standing right there in the trench with you because they'll not be pushed back. They'll stand there with the sword of the Spirit and fight. We go through difficulty, and I see the same faces that have stood there through those difficulties and fought with me, and we're in that warfare together. There's also those that you look to your right and left in the middle of the battle, and they're not there anymore because they've got themselves out of the back end of that trench, and they're running. They can't be relied upon. There must be factions and difficulties and trial and warfare so that those who are tested may be recognized among us. You need to stand and fight this Christian life is not a spectator sport. You can't just sit back and enjoy your life and watch while everybody else plays Christian. You've got to get in the battle. Build patience. This is a, the endurance that is needed for a long, hard military campaign. And if the Lord tarries and we go through one battle after another and we're sitting here together 30 years from now, 40 years from now, I want to look and see my brothers in the trench right there with me. We have to pursue with dogged consistency the endurance that is needed for a long, hard military campaign. And with that, you produce gentleness. This carries the sense, this word gentleness here, carries the sense of being gentle during trial, being gentle during suffering, during difficulty. You just have that gentle spirit, that resolved spirit that, listen, we trust in the Lord. Our trust is in the Lord. The Lord is sovereign. It's both remaining steadfast, trusting God's will, steadfast while doing God's will with the right heart attitude, with the right spirit. Listen, this pursuit, this pursuit is a consecration of your entire life to this battle. It's a consecration of all that you are to Christ, to the service of God. This is not easy. Not easy. Putting off, putting on is not easy. If you're fighting the battle as if it is, you need to wake up. It's not easy. Fleeing sin and pursuing righteousness is where the battle rages. That is the front line. Taking a stand for the faith is where the spiritual warfare is raging. That's why we need to understand, point three, we need to understand that we are in a Christian campaign. A campaign. 12 says, fight the good fight of faith. We've seen the command for a tactical retreat. We've seen the command to go on the offensive and pursue fruits of the Spirit. Here in verse 12 is the command for combat operations. This is a description of the Christian campaign. A campaign refers to a large-scale, long-duration strategy toward a strategic goal. Sounds like the Christian life, doesn't it? It's a long duration strategy. There should be a strategy in place for accomplishing a strategic goal. Paul told Timothy in chapter 1, wage the good warfare. It's the same concept here. The word that best describes the nature of this combat is the word fight, agonizu. It's from the word we get agonize, agony. It's a present tense ongoing imperative. It's a continuous way of life. It's contending or struggling with great effort against difficulties or dangers. It's striving after something with great zeal, with great fervency. It is taking it as if by force. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. The violent take it by force. Take it by warfare. Take it by zeal. It carries the sense of an outward engagement or fight as well as the inward striving, the inward turmoil, the inward distress, the inward agony that goes along with it. It's the same word used in chapter 4, verse 10 of this letter. For to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach, labor and strive, labor and toil. And it is a good fight, intrinsically good. Here, this good fight is the fight of the faith. In the original language, there's a direct article there. It's not simply faith. It is the faith. This is doctrine. This is those doctrines of the faith, once for all delivered to the saints, this is orthodox Christianity. 
This is to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. These are, from chapter 6, verse 3, the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, the Bible here joins together in verse 11 the two things in Scripture that can never be torn apart, both life and doctrine. Press on toward right living, pursue righteousness, and to pursue the faith. Life and doctrine, like peas and carrots, right? Like peanut butter and jelly, cookies and milk. They cannot go apart. They're connected. Doctrine without fervency in living it and in obeying it is dead orthodoxy. That's true of your Christian life. If you're here and you're learning doctrine, you certainly will in a biblical church that preaches and teaches God's word. You're going to learn doctrine. But if you're learning that doctrine, it isn't having a, a persistent, consistent effect on your fervency and zeal and obedience and service to the Lord, then to a degree you are dead orthodox already. It's dead orthodoxy. Together, this is light and heat. Life without doctrine is like a wild mysticism, a reckless faith with no center. We are to battle both with and for the truth. Now, the truth, in a sense, doesn't need to be defended. Spurgeon said, defend the Bible? I would as soon defend a lion. How do you defend a lion? You unchain it, and it will defend itself. But we are to be embattled. We are to be embattled with the truth and for the truth. There are those who assault the the truth. There are those who have no understanding of the truth. There are those who need the truth. They need the gospel. They need the Savior. There are those who assault the truth. They need to be stood against. You're to defend the truth in that sense. And wherever the battle rages, the quote goes, there the loyalty of the soldier is proven. And to be steady on all the battlefield besides that one point is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that one point. The battle rages today at the point of easy believism. The battle rages today at the point of legalism. The battle rages today at the point of evangelism. The battle rages today for right doctrine. There are so many assaults on the faith. Are you waging war? Ask yourself, how are you fighting? Fight for yourself as well. Calvin said, Christ calls all his servants to warfare. He calls us to warfare because point four, we have a glorious, a glorious strategic goal. A glorious strategic goal. Look at verse 12, halfway through. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Lay hold. It's a singular point. Lay hold. This here is not a progression. It is a full and final grasping, a full and final holding. Lay hold on eternal life. This is looking forward to the end of the war, the war our great goal, our victory in Christ. There's one sense in which uh, here is seeing the Christian life, in which you have eternal life and in which you must lay hold of eternal life. Another uh, perspective. There's a perspective in which you are to fight the good fight of faith in order to lay hold of eternal life. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Well, that's a powerful statement, isn't it not? Lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Eternal life is both a, a present possession and a future hope for the Christian. And the word for lay hold here is a word that means again, it means again with a violent force. Lay hold, to seize upon it. You lay hold of it. Listen, how many times do we have to hear the Christian life is not a life for a lazy person? It's not a life of leisure. You don't float to heaven on flowery beds of ease while your brothers and sisters have sailed through bloody seas. You must lay hold on eternal life. That victory 
all Christians are effectually and particularly called to. Called here, to which you were also called, is a second person, second person singular for you grammar guys. It means that the gospel here, the, the, the victory in Christ, is something to which Timothy particularly, Timothy individually is effectually called by God. It is not a, it's not the general call, the gospel that goes out to all. This is a very specific, a very particular, a very individual and effectual call to Timothy. If you are in Christ, it is very particular, a very individual, a very personal call to you that you will lay hold on eternal life. This is a particular call. We know there's a general call to the gospel. There is something different here. This is the doctrine of effectual calling. Hopefully we'll have time next week to get into what that means. But he was called. He was called and he confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses, most likely at Timothy's baptism. It began the fight. He was called by God, effectually called, caused to be born again by God's Spirit, and the battle began. The battle began. Called by God's Spirit, given an inheritance in heaven, empowered by God's Spirit to fight the good fight of faith, and Timothy will certainly, if he perseveres, lay hold upon that for which Christ laid hold of him. This is confession of the good fight of faith, confession of the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. This is the beginning of the battle for Timothy. Where did it begin for you? Where did it begin for you? Since the onslaught of the battle that has raged since that point, how much ground have you given up? How much ground have you gained? Where are you in the fight? Have you retreated to your tent? Or are you still in the trench waging holy warfare against the forces of the enemy, against your flesh, against this world? Will you answer God's call to fight the good fight of faith? Will it be said of you, O oh man of God? Will it be said of you, O oh woman of God? Will you fight? Will you awaken yourself out of that sinful lethargy and get yourself engaged in warfare? Will you link arms with your brothers in arms and fight? The battle is not for a lazy man, not for a lazy woman. It's not for an undisciplined or lacking in self-control. It takes strategy. It takes great effort. It takes wisdom. It takes weapons that are not of this world. It takes the Lord and His Spirit and His strength and His power. It takes faith in Christ. It takes belief in all that God has promised. It takes violence, force, effort, zeal, fervency. Will you wake up? Will you fight? These are not platitudes. This calls you to a decision, calls you to a response. You, will you fight? If you do not, you're already standing on a slippery slope that leads to perdition and destruction. The longer that you go, will you fight stronger? The longer that you press on, will you learn that perseverance the longer that you go, the older that you are, the longer that the Lord preserves you in the faith, will you press? Will you take it by force? This is Timothy and his charge from Paul to pursue with fervency and zeal that for which Christ has laid hold of him. We must fight. If you have no power to fight, cry out to God for mercy. Cry out to God, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I'm not in the fight, the good fight of faith, because I am an enemy of God by my wicked works. God, save me and put me in the battle on the right side. Cry out to God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, 
Lord, thank you for the weapons that you've provided for us that are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. God, strengthen us for battle. May it be said of us, God, well done, good and faithful slave. And may it be well described of us that we are men and women of God in the battle, pursuing that for which Christ laid hold of us by faith in him for your glory. It's for our eternal good, God, but for your worship, for your praise, victory is yours. May we be trophies of that victory, God, for your worship forevermore. We love you, and it's Christ's name that we pray. Amen.